When the apocalypse came, it was not at the hands of corrupt corporations or an invading army from beyond the sky. It was not an act of cruel gods or even a simple mistake in a lab. It was a fluke of nature, of mutation and evolution. It began as a small thing, a simple altering of behavioral patterns amongst some of my planet's wildlife, namely the harmless Gricky Mouse, a common and friendly creature towards the salted, often kept as a pet by small children. The once harmless and pacifistic creatures slowly turned more and more violent. Thankfully, in the beginning of this change in behavior, nobody was ever hurt nor killed but the pattern of escalating violent encounters was worrisome. Conferences were held to come up with a plan of action to not only figure out why this was happening, but also how to stop it. If only they'd spent more time actually coming up with ideas and implementing them than arguing with each other. We might have been spared what was to come. As it stood, our leaders were too slow to act and those that did act did so with incompetence. Bureaucracy was our worst enemy at the time, but soon that had changed. Patient Zero was a small girl, who had the misfortune of encounter a new variant of the Gricky. By now the changes had become more severe, and when the mouse attacked and bit her, it was all over. She was rescued by her parents, who eliminated the mouse and took their daughter to a local clinic. By the time they arrived at the clinic, only twenty units had passed, and her condition was deteriorating quickly. Her condition, as recorded by her attending physician, was startling. As later records would corroborate, infection had several clear symptoms. High fever, to the degree that certain organs suffered, accelerated failure, intense seizures, bestial sounds ruptured blood vessels in the eyes and olfactory receptors. Increased aggression with a tendency towards bite attempts. The child exhibiting a surge of intense strength that should not have been possible. Broke free of her restraints and attacked the doctor, biting him several times before she was pulled from him. Clumps of fur dangling from her mouth even as she turned on the nurses that now attempted to subdue her. The infection spread quickly after that. Patients devoured in their beds. Nurses and doctors fleeing and security attempting to put down the crazed patients now attacking them. It did little good. And from the hospital the infection grew, spreading out into the city and then the cities neighboring it. Swarms of infected gathered and hunted down survivors. Our leaders didn't know what to do, and they soon perished at the hands of their own citizens. Survivors banded together in a bid to simply wait out the end, while others formed roving gangs that preyed on the living simply because they could. The infected did not discriminate. All were prey, and their numbers only grew. That was several months ago. Things have settled down somewhat since then but the risk of being overrun by swarms is still there. The gangs had mostly killed themselves off thanks to infighting, and many had never found a place to hole up and fortify. The few gangs that still existed had found a sort of equilibrium with other survivors. A mutual desire to survive led to limited cooperation. Without the food that survivors tended to grow, the gangs would starve without the resources that the gangs could provide. Be they weapons, manpower, or medicines they scavenged, the survivors would be unable to create more food. It was a symbiotic relationship that most subscribed to, though some did just fine without it. I was but a child at the time that things began to change for the better. My settlement was one of the more well-off kinds. Plenty of space plenty of resources, and a well-defined pact with the closest and strongest of the gangs. Honestly, we had achieved some small sense of normalcy, within our walls, that is. Outside them it was chaos and danger without end. That is, till a voice we had never heard before spoke to us over the radio. 
It was a different voice, one clearly filtered through a translator, and in that moment we knew we were not alone in the universe. Our people hadn't yet reached the stars, but the stars had reached us. Looks like you folks could use some help. You just say the word, we'll be there in a jiffy. The strange voice said, the radio operator looking up at my father who was the second of our settlement, the second being a sort of assistant leader to the first, who made the final decisions. I mean, yes, we could use some help, but who are you? What settlement are you from? My father asked, and there was a little chuckle from the mysterious voice. Ain't no settlement you've heard of, that's for sure. It'll be easier to explain in person. See you soon. The line went dead, and we wondered just what we'd inadvertently invited onto our world. We quickly found out, as there came a boom from the sky, and many eyes turned skyward. Streaks of fire approached rapidly, then curved, altering course, and streaking for the land outside our walls. We knew these newcomers were doomed. The swarms would get them for sure. The streaks of whatever they were impacted outside our settlement, and the guards reported that they seemed to be metal boxes. Another lone streak approached the settlement, this one clearly different from the others, as it began to enter a spiral pattern of descent, each loop larger than the last, and the object slowing with each. Quickly we saw that it was some sort of aircraft, a large one with strange markings and iconography. With a squealing roar of engines, it slowed to a hover over the main square of the settlement, extending landing struts and coming to a rest with such grace that hardly seemed possible. A ramp started to lower with a hiss of equalizing pressure, revealing to us a fellow biped though this one was shorter than we were, and covered in some sort of exoskeleton. At least it looked like an exoskeleton. In reality, it was simply an environment suit, as we discovered when the small biped approached us, the domed faceplate turning translucent and revealing a face to us. It had soft pink skin, wrinkles around the corners of its eyes, and short fur on the top of its head. It made an expression with what we assumed was its mouth, one we hoped was an expression of pleasure and not hostility, and then it raised its arms. Howdy, folks. Name's Jimmy, and we here at the ZF stand ready to help however we can. The strange biped spoke, suddenly flanked by two taller bipeds, in what could only be described as the most intimidating combat armor we'd ever seen. My name is Rule. I am the second for this settlement, and we welcome you. Though you should be warned that if you attempt to exploit us, we will defend ourselves. My father said, and Jimmy nodded. Understandable. Rest assured we really do just want to help. Ain't no exploitation in our playbooks. All we want to do is help you fine furry folk out. Take care of your Z problem, and have fun while doing it. The being said, planting their hands upon what was assumed to be their hips. My father blinked, then nodded, though all of us were still wary of this strange alien. Very well. Then, how do you intend to help? The swarms are unstoppable. We've only managed to survive this long. Because decoys and simply staying out of their notice. Oh, you leave the how to us. Trust me, this ain't the first time we've dealt with a planet full of Zeds. You folk just sit back and enjoy the show. With that, he whistled, and the boxes outside the walls began to unfold, revealing strange machines within them. They had far too many legs, the armor plating on them smooth and curved, affording no places for anything to grab onto them. 
The machines rose, canopies turning translucent and revealing more bipeds sitting at the controls. These ones wore less than the ones before us, simple casual attire that looked well-worn. With hoots and much hollering, the machines sped off into the cities, weapons appearing from hidden hardpoints and from the ends of manipulator arms. My people could only watch in shock as the machines began tearing into swarms of infected, unleashing predatory ferocity upon them and coming out unscathed. And so began a campaign of reclamation. We stayed within our walls, ensuring the strange bipeds, now known as humans, got their fill of bloodshed without us getting in the way. But as it became clear, there was no way for them to reasonably clear our world of this vile infection through boots-on-the-ground methods, as they called it. And so they informed us of a plan that would not only eradicate the infected, but would also return our world to us in a state as though it had been untouched by the apocalypse. Now it was an extreme plan, but it was going to work. They deployed millions of small drones that used something called a temporal imager, the drones flying over every square inch of our planet in a matter of weeks and seeing it as it once was. As for my people, we were taken from our world up to a habitat in space, the first any of our species had set foot amongst the stars. The humans were kind and generous, but also firm when it came to cracking down on the more lawless of us. But they were fair. There were no executions, no enslavement, just people trying to help us and keep us alive. So it had been. We did not see the glassing of our homeworld. We did not see the drones taking samples of every animal and bacteria on the planet. Everything was catalogued and recorded. The ships cleansed our world with flame from orbit. Oceans sizzled and evaporated. Flesh seared and stripped from bone. The swarms could not stand against such wrath, and they too perished. But that was not the end of our planet. When the last square centimetre had been scorched and rendered uninhabitable, new bombs were dropped. These bombs carried a payload of something called nanites, whose sole job was to rebuild our world just as it had been before the apocalypse. Minus the infected, of course. The scorched and irradiated surface was quickly healed. Radiation cleared in a matter of days, and lush forests returned. The oceans refilled with sparkling, pristine water. Plant and animal life flourished, and even our cities were rebuilt. Homes were just as they'd been left. No signs of struggle or terror. Utterly pristine. And then we were returned home to a world of peace. The nanites went dormant, carried within every living thing and ensuring such an event could never happen again. Sickness had been conquered, but time and age were still our enemies. Many returned home to broken families, for the humans could not return the dead to us. Many homes stood empty for months after our planet was reclaimed and the trauma was too much for some. But we endured, and with the help of our new friends, we began to prosper once more. They helped where they could, but began pulling back slowly, allowing us to be independent like we once had been. But that was not the end of our interactions with humanity. We knew they were out there, and they wanted to welcome us to the stars. They didn't help too much, allowing us to figure things out ourselves, and for that, we are grateful. I remember those days like they were only yesterday, and looking at this monument to those we lost and the new friends we have made, I doubt I'll ever forget. I turn away from the monument and board a transport, my heart's racing as I'm handed a special uniform by the human officer smiling at me. I look at the patch on the shoulder, a smile of my own crossing my lips. It's time to join those that only wish to help and do my part against the Zeds, wherever they might show up. And so the Zombie Extermination Task Force goes to find its next challenge.